Good afternoon YouTube, this is Warbles on a lot here with chemtrail theory versus the facts and history of air delivered chemical weapons and uh, because there's a fair bit of it is going to come out of this textbook Weapons of Tomorrow by Brian Beckett I'm going to try a little bit of a book reading published by Orbis in London in 1982 alright so it's it's not new but it uh, has some interesting stuff in it now here we have the E96 bacteriological warfare or chemical warfare cluster bomblet right we'll get back to that a little bit later now I'm going to read a big chunk of this chemical weapons and warfare the nerve gases chemical weapons were not used in world war ii although various types were developed and considered a made the major allied discovery was chemical herbicides which were developed in britain and handed over to the americans for further work by 1945 a plan had been drawn up to use these herbicides against japan as part of the campaign to invade and conquer the japanese home islands in 1945 and 46. according to the plan some 20,000 tons of the herbicide 24d 2,4-dichlorophenoxyacetic acid would have been spread across the 3.1 million hectares or 7.8 million acres planted in rice and distributed at around 2.25 kilograms per hectare or 2 pounds per acre. Two 2,4-D preparations were developed. The first was a 3% solution in a mixture of tributyl phosphate diesel oil. The second was a granular solid mixture for use against irrigated rice and was to be carried by a cluster munition. The liquid variety would have been carried by aircraft and distributed from spray or smoke tanks from altitudes of between 15 and 30 metres. 50 to 100 feet. That's how high you have to be to deliver a chemical weapon. Also considered was an attack on Japan's 1.8 million hectares, 4.4 million acres given over to crops such as wheat and barley. This attack would probably have used isopropyl N-phenylcarbamate, also distributed at 2.25 kilograms per hectare. The powerful herbicide 245T, which is 245-trichlorophenoxyacetic acid, a simple chemical extension of 2,4-D, was also developed during the war, but does not seem to have been included in the agent scheduled for use against Japan. After the war, however, 2,4-5-T became the constituent of many commercial weed killers and military herbicides, including the famous Agent Orange used in Vietnam. Many countries have now banned it as a commercial herbicide because of its dangerous side effects, which include the possibility of genetic damage. And... In Vietnam, the Operation Ranch Hand was conducted at an altitude of 100 feet above the trees. Um, here we go. Here we see an extended range binary nerve gas artillery shell. Whereas over here, we have the basic outline design for the binary big eye bomb. Now, both of these are um, designed to deliver toxic agents which need to be mixed before they are delivered. Um, the artillery shell uses the concussion of launch to fracture discs here and the spin of the shell through the air to mix the constituents, whereas the binary big eye bomb, if the aircraft's electrical system can handle it, there's an electric motor here which works a shaft with three little propellers to mix the outer chemical with the inner chemical when these veins have opened if the aircraft does not have a sufficient electrical system to do that, you've got a rocket motor here. And uh, this Catherine wheel spins the central core of the binary bomb and the open paddles churn the mixture into being ready for use. Okay. Now, there's a particular graph I wanted to show you. Uh, here we go. Now, Get a goodly look at that graph. We've got different agents in the different columns. We've got a logarithmic scale from 1,100,000 kilograms per square kilometre. 10,000 k's, right? That's about, ooh, well, it's 10 tonnes. 1,000 kilograms, 100 kilograms, 10 kilograms. 
The graph above shows an approximate comparison of the differences of sarin and three of the older biological agents in the E96 cluster four pound bomblet. I showed you that at the start. Because of differences in data and parameters, the figures are not directly comparable, but taking everything into account, the graph does give a reasonable idea of the relative effectiveness of chemical and bacteriological warfare agents. Okay, so, sarin, which is the nerve gas used by Om Shinrikyo in Japan, in Tokyo, in order to kill 50% of the people in your square kilometre, you need to have... 95 kilograms of sarin if you've got perfect conditions for the attack which is light air in early morning or late evening 15 degrees celsius or calm night at minus 20 to plus 15 degrees if you've got sarin at any other time in a fresh breeze above 15 degrees then you need 11 or 1200 kilograms of it it's over a ton per square kilometer if you've got slurried botulinus toxin, which is the most potent chemical on the planet, um, we're talking 10 tonnes per kilometre, per square kilometre. Slurried anthrax, uh, 1.2 tonnes. Slurried brucellosis, where the conditions are unstated, we only need about uh, 300 kilograms per square kilometre. Now, that's pretty serious amount of weight to be carrying in an aircraft tons per square kilometer nobody that uh, I know of has aeroplanes that can do that but uh, I will show you some exceptions now up at the back of the book we have some really interesting formulas and I'm going to inflict note 14 on you much of the myth of biological warfare comes from interpreting toxicities literally the fact that one ounce of botulin toxin A is more than enough to kill every person on earth is a statistic with immediate impact. But toxicities are highly dependent upon the nature of the experiment. The agent may be administered orally or through inhalation. Again, it may be injected intravenously or into the muscles. Toxicities often vary widely between the various routes. Toxicities are also likely to vary widely with the type of test animal and it is not always certain that any result is valid for humans. Thus, if 0.0003 micrograms of botulin toxin A per kilogram of body weight is the minimum lethal injected dose for mice, and an average person weighs 70 kilograms, 0.0021 micrograms is the minimum lethal human dosage, but only if botulin has the same activity in men as it does in mice. Taking things a step further, it would take 8.3307 grams or 0.2938 ounces of botulin to depopulate the planet in 1975. The world's population was estimated at 3.967 billion. <coughs> but only so long as everybody lined up for their injection and received exactly the right amount. So you're probably going to need three quarters of an ounce instead of a third of an ounce because there's now seven billion of us. In theory, Spreading a few kilograms of botulin evenly over the earth would be enough to threaten the world's population through inhalation and ingestion, but the practical problems of weapon inefficiency and aerobiological decay make the reality dramatically different. On the basis of the US Army's figures for the four-pound E-96 cluster bomblet, see, we meet up with it again, it would take 130,863,000 tonnes of bacterial warfare filling charged with botulin toxin A, which is the most potent chemical on the planet, or potent agent on the planet, to cause 50% casualties to the American population, to kill half the people in America in 1975. 130.863 million tonnes of the stuff. The attacker would have to blanket the United States with 551,749,000,000 bomblets, giving the, a plant with Vigo's capacity, they'd have to spend... 183,916 years making the bacterial warfare filling at full production. Okay, I'm going to try and take the camera off and pause it. Now let's have a look at Time Life Books. The Air War in Europe, published in 1979. Here we have on page 96 and 97... A photograph taken from the rear door gunner, as they called them, the view 
on a B17. It looks like an E model, they've got no chin turrets. And you can see the condensation trails coming out of the engines of the escort fighters. Weaving over the top of the bombers because the fighters have to fly at their ideal speed and the bombers can't go even half that fast. So, the fighters are up there in air that's really, really cold. And although there's not enough moisture to form a cloud, if you take the hydrogen which is in the hydrocarbon fuel which the engines were burning and this is what they would have been burning pure isooctane all of that hydrogen mixes with the oxygen in the air and 20% of the air is oxygen or 21% so more water comes out the back of the engine than went in the front of the engine and the extra water once it cools down it condenses into a trail of water condensation when the first jets came out, because they consume a lot more air in order to burn the huge quantities of fuel that they burn, and they fly really high in order to try and reduce their fuel consumption, it was found that jets make lovely contrails because they're flying in cold air. For the purposes of air shows, with either a piston engine or a jet engine, you pump oil into the exhaust and the oil vaporizes and you can create an oil vapour trail and the oil vapour trail is pretty much instantly visible at the back of the engine right the oil puffs into a vapour straight away with the heat as distinct from chemicals pumped from aircraft low over the ground which are instantly visible when they come out the spray bars under the wings as shown in this aircraft which is actually doing an emergency dump purely for the photography or possibly to demonstrate its use as an aerial firefighter this aircraft could carry about one ton of liquid and when the passenger jets came in they were very very thirsty and they still are and all the wings are full of fuel and all the fuselage is full of passengers and they cannot carry any excess weight they can't lift it they've got nowhere to store it they can't be carrying 10 tonnes of chemicals per square kilometre that they fly over. And they don't fly around at low altitude either. Those photos come from Aircraft Aircraft, 1968, so I got this thing when I was seven. So, once again, the cold air goes in, carrying invisible water vapour and oxygen. The oxygen is mixed with the hydrogen in the fuel, and it's burnt at extraordinarily high temperatures, exactly the kind of temperatures you would use if you were running a toxic chemical incinerator, the sort that everybody argues not in my backyard. And condensation trails visible behind aircraft have a space of clear air visible behind the engine's exhaust and at the commencement of the condensation trail, and in that clear space, the exhaust air is still superheated, it hasn't cooled down. And uh, them's the facts, fellas. At the moment, the largest serious aeroplane that's in use dropping liquid onto the planet is the Martin Mars. They were designed for the US Navy. World War II ended before they could see much in the way of military service. They only ever built four of the damn things. And uh, there's a couple of them still in use in North America. Every couple of years Australia thinks about getting them. Some of them dump their water through the sides. And I think some of them dump their water directly out the bottom, but I'm not real sure. I haven't read the article for a long time. Once again, you can see the water coming out. All 60,000 pounds of it. 30 tonnes. Right, that's the one that seems to be dropping out the bottom, but it could be just using the tank on the other side of the aircraft. They can dump one or the other. So, when you look at the evidence and lay it all out, it's pretty clear that there's no such thing as a chemtrail campaign anywhere in the world, except in the minds of the chemtrolls who want to believe it. Condensation trails have been around since the 1940s. Absolutely, I remember them in the 60s. 
The airliners have nowhere to put the chemicals and they can't lift the weight and the engines would destroy the chemicals with the heat. They don't fly low enough to disperse it and they couldn't carry enough anyway. Forget about chemtrails.